Hi, my name is Wendy Ertnowski, and on this DVD we're going to hopefully show you how to put together, or give you some ideas of how we put ours together, the Strega ARF manufactured by Brodax. But just I wanted to take a minute or so and just give you a brief history of the Strega design. The Strega design goes back to 1983, 1984 when the original one was designed and built. A lot of the aerodynamics of the original design were based on the aerodynamics of the Pattern Master designed by Big Jim Greenaway and slightly modified. It was published in Flying Models, became one of the best-selling Brodak kits, and now is I think the top of the line ARF available today. Several of course have been built and this one in particular is built by Kent Tyser but many many have been built been built and modified to look like planes not not like the original Strega but we're concerned with here is getting the ARF and maybe getting it put together in one day I hope hope that's what's gonna happen and maybe even getting out to the field tomorrow and getting some flights on it so when you get your box, and, in, and I've been so anxious to, to get mine, I've taken a box, emptied out the contents, laid them out on the floor, and I've really been impressed with the quality, the workmanship, the quality. And what I'm going to look for as I put this together is anything that looks like... Now, keep in mind, this is a, this is a ship that's designed to be a world-class stunt ship. It's got to be compromised slightly, and ever so slightly, because it's an ARF. If you were building this plane from scratch, you would probably be 150 to 200 hours. Well, we're going to have about five hours work ahead of us today assembling this, and hopefully in one day, get out to the field and get some flights on it. Now, anytime you approach a product like this, the first, and I, got, I have to admit, I'm, I'm, prone not to do this. I buy a new piece of electronic equipment or a new tool for the shop and right away I want to run off and use it without reading the instructions. This might be a good time to change that and it might be a great idea to keep in mind the instructions in this case are critical. There's a lot of do's and don'ts, a lot of steps that'll save you a lot of aggravation. Now we're not going to show each step on the DVD because by the time you have an ARF you'll already have this in your possession. But keep in mind when John Brodak designs a, an ARF or a kit, he personally builds it. I know this for a fact. Every kit that leaves the Brodak warehouse, he's already built, and a finished model is sitting in his hobby shop on display. So that what happens is in the course of building it, he can come across little things that might not fit, might be a problem. Now, in this case, because this model is a complete, this is the top of the line ARF in the world today, in my opinion. There's also supplemental instructions, so you'd probably want to read these too. And there's some good tips in here. They refer to changes in the original ones or upgrades. Now, as a third thing, we're going to also look at making some upgrades of our own along the way, because we have a different motive here. What we want to do is not use this model as an ARF. We're going to use this model for two things, as a demonstration model. Probably within a month, everybody in our club will have flown it. When we go to local contests, when we go to Brodax, we'll certainly build, bring it. And what happens is we want to have a little bit more durability built in that a sport flyer wouldn't really care about. And I don't know where that where those things are going to be, but they're small upgrades. They don't mean that the original thing is wrong. What what it does mean is when we, when you're going to make a taxi cab or a police car out of a normal car, sometimes you put in a little bit heavier duty stuff, but this is designed for the average person and it's designed that it's number one it's easy to assemble and it's got a good performance when it's done. Now we're going to try to find out when we get ours we're also going to make a DVD on trimming it flight trimming it getting it ready for the field and that's going to be hopefully and even get some flights on it so the first step step one would be have a cup of coffee look over the instructions look over the supplements now an example of how I approach a project like this 
is I get myself a colored marker and as I do each step as I do a step I cross it off and then I go on to the next step I try to do it in a logical sequence a lot of times you can save yourself a lot of effort just by following the instructions John puts a lot of effort and a lot of the pictures are very self-explanatory in a lot of cases now in our case the monocode iron the heat gun you can tighten up the covering that would be step one that's how he has got step one on here now one of the ways you can get the wrinkles out and it's certainly not the best way but it's one of the ways that'll I guess old school you can use a heat gun sometime if you have a good hair dryer you can even use a hair dryer and you can get wrinkles out well, the thing is I don't want to spend a lot of time doing this right now because this is one of the things that from time to time you still have to do when a plane's been flown sits out in the sun it's always a good idea to just re-shrink the covering and that you can do over and over again and, and really probably the best way is with the heat gun but being able to do the maintenance on it that's part of any ARF now before we can insert the control horn this is the next step I want to clean out this little area that little piece of monocoat out of there so the flaps will sit in there better I want that pressed down so that this is even I want that in all the way I want this to sit flat now I'm going to epoxy this in place just one little toothpick a drop of epoxy in there Send some paint cans on here to let it dry just make sure we have all that monocoat out of the way. Okay, while the epoxy is drying, what's a good thing to do is sight down and make sure that the flaps aren't off. They should be parallel. In other words, so you don't have a pre built in flap tweak. The next step is to pretty much do the same thing with the elevators that we did with the flaps and create one unit. Need to get a little bit of the monocoat out of there, covering, so that the horn sits parallel to this leading edge. It should sit parallel. It should not sit out or sit in. And we do the same thing, some slow drying epoxy, put it in with a toothpick, set it out on a table with two paint cans, and it's going to dry in one area. Then we want to sight down and make sure the two elevators are in good alignment. If not, give them a little tweak, a little bend. And we'll be ready to move on to step four. Now it turns out these lined up pretty well. But if it didn't, it wouldn't be a big deal. Just and it's and it's also possible if you wanted to, you could do that tweaking just by taking the elevators off and using two pliers not really necessary but you do want to get these flaps and elevators perfectly flat that's absolutely important to getting the the ship at least to have a that it's going to fly off the bench as level as possible and what we're going to do when we do the, the actual trimming video which will be a separate video we're going to detail how to how to maximize if you've already got something crooked how to correct it or if you're looking for more performance or less performance by making adjustments to suit your flying style and for me again what works is as I go through this I flip the page I know I've done everything on that page and I go on to the next step now we're going to be using a rojet and a nice thing about the rojets is the 51, 60, 65 and 76 all have the same bolt pattern so what it's going to allow us to do is is use four different engines in the same plane. Now what I did, what John recommended, grind away part of a pencil, mark the holes that allows you to get the pencil up in place. And we also, we're, we're hoping we're going to be able to get a side exhaust engine too. This is a rear exhaust. We're going to have to cut some of this away to use the rear exhaust. But I want to be able to use a lot of different engines because we're going to be using this as a test model and maybe at the very end of this test and and luckily enough there's enough room in here 
we may even want to put our 90 in at some point in time but right now we want to use the engines the Rojets series of engines a little tip you can use to get everything centered in this case we need three pieces of masking tape on each side of the motor and what that does it holds it in the center while we mark these holes very accurately now I marked them this holds it centered and it keeps it that we the one thing you don't want to have is that the motor is facing the inside of the circle if it's straight or a little bit outward fine but not facing in and when we do the trim video we're going to really emphasize how how to check that accurately and adjust it after the model has even been finished and ready to fly it's nice that tape holds it centered and we've actually added a few more pieces to get what amounts to be just a nice press fit so that's pressed right in place and we can do just a final check on where we put the little the little pencil dots and then get these holes drilled out and we also want to check because on a rojet these come different lengths and I want to make sure I have a little bit of clearance in fact I'm going to set this back just a tad I want a little clearance for the spinner I don't want to have it that it's rubbing up on this ring Now I can take a, and this is just an old piece of scrap music wire, run it on a grindstone until I have a point. And what that allows me to do, now here's my little pencil marks, I can get a little start for the drill. It just allows the drill to get catch in there a little bit easier. Now I checked that all my dots, when I look down into those holes, that I'm right on center because it's easier to adjust these holes right now. now if you go down to a any Home Depot or Lowe's you can buy a much longer than standard drill a 125 drill in the case of if for instance if we had a uh, a way of getting this into the drill press and hold it 90 degrees but we don't so we're gonna have to do this just by eyeball Now it's always good if you can use an undersized drill. In this case, if you had an 093, because what it allows you to do is just get everything, and I'm trying to do this by eye. And if we didn't have the top block installed, we could do this in a drill press. This is probably the one part of building the whole ARF that, that needs to be done pretty accurately. This and drilling the holes in the motor mount plates. But because the Rojets have such good interchangeability, we can go from 61, 65, 76 and never change holes or never change the crankshaft length. Now we have to relieve the top for the blind nuts it has to go in just like the directions say about and and we have a little trick for doing that now the blind nuts that we're going to be using 138 and what we have is a 138 drill a little undersized but we don't want to drill a whole hole through I only want to drill down the length of the blind nut so what I do is I put a piece of tape on here roughly that thickness and this allows me when I go in from the top when I see the tape starting to hit the motor mount I know I've gone far enough and that just allows me it's an easy way to see the yeah, that's about in fact I could go a little bit deeper than that just a tad and all we need to do is just go in We're only taking out a tiny bit of material. And if you don't do this step, what happens, it'll tend to split the motor mount unnecessarily. Now I need to clean up all these loose little pieces with a little, whoop, little piece of sandpaper. And we're ready to bolt the motor in. Now another trick here, one of the things that I do a little extra step is I want to take and put a little bit of oil on the threads just a drop 
on the threads of the blind nets so that there's no chance there's no chance that what's going to happen is CA is going to wick in there and clog up my blind nuts. So before I install a motor in the blind nuts, just one drop of any kind of oil, 3-in-1 oil is good. Don't want to get the whole thing soaked. I just want to have some oil on the threads so that CA will tend not to stick on there when I put these bolts in place. Also, we're going to do, and this is one of the, the updates for step four. We want to set these before I put the blind nuts, and I want to put these in place. You notice that they rub up against the tank shim. I want to get these in place because these would each one would be individual, and I need to mark on here because I can already see the holes. And I can put this up against the motor now. I know I know they need to be. at that position. I can line this up with the bolt holes here. And that will give me my position. I can take that little tool with the point on it, put a scratch on each one, and drill these out. So these are going to be a perfect fit for that. Now a little trick for laying this out when you're going to drill this on, because this can be drilled on a drill press is you can put a piece of tape on these, get the front to back dimension, and just look down here like a gun sight. See that they're right on the spot where you want them to be. And that's something you can do in a drill press. Makes that a lot easier. Now using a drill press, I've got these, here's a one tip I've learned never hold these with your bare hand and by the way I use a vice grip you can you can probably it's convenient to drill two at the same time if you wanted to use a starter drill if you're a real machinist but these can be drilled oversized these don't have to be absolutely within thousands and it's a key part of the longevity of the motor, having pads underneath the motor. It spreads the load. A lot of reasons for having these under the motor. It keeps the alignment. It gives you a bigger surface to clamp to. These are really a good, a good thing. Don't leave these out. Believe me, you never want to be holding this by a drill press if that catches that more accidents happen in drill presses. Anyway. This is a slightly oversized drill, and what I do, I just break the edge. This is just because I'm trying to do this as professionally as possible. And it's these little tips that anytime I drill a hole in aluminum, I'd like to just break that edge. No special reason, just because we're proud of what we do. Now we're ready to install everything and tighten the blind nuts and get the blind nuts permanently installed. That's the next step. Now with everything bolted in, we know we have a little drop of oil on our blind nuts. I'm going to put a little thin CA first, then some thick CA, and then some epoxy. And if that sounds like it's a lot, it probably is because I don't want these bolts loosening up. I'll have to shorten these bolts. Yeah, I guess not. They don't come out. No, no reason to even shorten them. Thin CA is the capillary thing that goes in there. Now, they suggest using epoxy to fuel proof things. You could also, one of the choices is you could use CA, of course. Thin CA, particularly. In fact, I think that's what we'll do is just everything here. What I'm going to do now is just soak, soak the motor mounts, the part that may get some oil on it. That'll certainly fuel proof it. Or you could take another good way to do it is with the with the epoxy and thin it. Thin it with just a little bit of alcohol. Get some up on here. This may be prone. Even though these motors don't leak any oil. Not like the old days where the planes got soaked with oil. Modern planes with the especially rear exhaust, you get almost no oil on a plane at all, which is really a real benefit for an ARF is to be Now we've been working on this about an hour. We're making good progress. And right here, and I think this is great, John. 
John puts right at the bottom of this, right now is a good time to take a coffee break. Now even though we have this little hatch and it's it's probably going to be not too difficult if we have to get in here and replace a blind nut or something. It's really convenient that we have that hatch up there. But I'd still like these blind nuts not to loosen up. Remember, we plan to use this as a taxi cab, as a demonstrator. So we want everything just a little more bulletproof maybe than an average person. It's just going to use it to fly on weekends or whatever. And looking at it from every way, that's a nice solid system. That's a nice solid way to work, work that engine mounting thing out. Now the only thing we're going to have to do, some of this is going to have to get dremeled away when we put our exhaust system on. Not a, not a, real, uh, a real big deal, but I was hoping we'd have the side exhaust engine here by now, but because we're in this nice little gap of winter weather, I wanted to get the flight is tomorrow. And the goal is I want to see if you can really do this is is buy an ARF on Friday, build it Saturday, fly it Sunday. I really want to I want to prove that to myself. Now whether you use the epoxy or thin CA to to seal up all this raw wood doesn't really matter. The trick is not to get any in the blind nuts. So what I did before I did this step, I ran a little more oil down into my blind nuts. And we have to go get the tank, get ready to put the tank in here. And of course you could seal this up with a couple of coats of Brodac dope too. Now one of the few things I'm going to do that's a little bit different than probably the average person is I'm going to use one of my carbon fiber tanks. And to get this in, I'm going to have to remove a little piece of the nose ring. These are a little bit thicker than the regular tank, so I'm going to have to take out just a slight piece of this nose ring with a Dremel tool so that that tank can get slid in. Now, there's a couple of advantages of this for me, is I have a pretty good idea where the, um, the shim will be relative to... I won't spend a lot of time shimming it, even though probably you will need some time. And, and I also know that this is a good match for the Rojet engine. This has been... We're pretty well proven over the last five years. It's a design that Wayne Triven came up with, and the late Wayne Triven, I should say, and thanks to him, these are available. They're expensive, but on the other hand, the tank that goes in the ARF is probably a good choice. This is one that I'm more comfortable with for what I'm going to be doing with it. Now, a couple of nice things that I realized, and I had to get rid of a little more than, a little less than half of this nose ring, and I'll clean that up. I also can move, get rid of a little bit of this material here. This, this is certainly a little bit overkill. But now my tank slides right in. I know what the shim is. And I can get that pretty well positioned in place. Now, on metal tanks, you want to have a removable shim. On these tanks, there's little glue posts. They only get glued into the corners. And here's the good news, is when that sits, and with the engine in place, Here's the best news of all. We got enough room probably to have almost a seven ounce tank if you're going to be using, for instance, if if we decide we want to put our 90 in here and use this for a 90 test ship, we have enough room for a seven inch long tank. So gives us a lot of choices. Anyway, we'll glue this in. We have a pretty good idea what the shim on this is. And then we can move on to the next step. Now what I thought I'd do is, because I wanted to remove some of this material and fuel proof it, and what I did, I wanted to have a little bit of an air outlet up here. I tried to figure out how I could do that. One of the things I thought would look reasonable anyway is I could put a little, a kind of a, we call it a dolphin hole up here, but what happened is, and it's my own fault, I went a little bit too far. I guess I took the pencil line off. So we will have a little bit of air going in, and I'll put a little piece of monocoat over that later, but. If you're suspecting, say you're in Arizona or in Texas, and you're suspecting you might at some point in time want to put a dolphin hole in here, this would be the time to do it. Now, we got this all fuel proof. This is ready. I haven't actually put the tank in yet permanently because I have one other thing that's going to make a lot of sawdust. I need to remove some of this material away, and this is unique because what I'm going to have is a rear exhaust engine. I want to be able to put rear exhaust engines in here. So even if I get a side exhaust engine, I want to have this piece cut out. So the next thing is I need to Dremel and lay out and put that header on the engine. 
and see that I have enough clearance back here. With the rear exhaust header I can just leave that's how far back it has to go and I can just start taking material away until it drops drops in relatively conveniently. Now what I'm doing, I'm resting this on some towels and trying to get that last little bit of material. Now obviously on a side exhaust engine you'd have to cut a hole in the side of the cowling. Now of course every motor installation is going to be just a little bit different whether you use any brand actually side exhaust or rear exhaust but that's that's going to give me enough clearance you need on a rear exhaust engine you need plenty of clearance here so air can flow through and those vents they actually are pretty good that worked out very well. In fact, now, now as soon as I get, the reason I wanted to do, you could see all that grinding, because I didn't want to have the tank in place and get dust all over the tank. We're pretty, dope, we're pretty well done with our grinding operations here. Now we can install a tank. Now, of course, your tank may be different than this. Metal tanks may be shim different for different motors, but this is a good starting spot for a Rojet. For a rojet, right off of the shim would be where I would start. Now we're ready to move on to the next step. Getting all that work done on the nose took approximately another hour. Drove roughly a two hours, a little more than two hours into this. Now the next step, you can take each one of the hinges, fold it back, just dip it in a little WD-40 or some kind of oil anyway. You don't want to get the hinge oily you want some of that to work its way down in there now when I'm all done I wipe this down with isopropyl alcohol just to clean any oil that's on there off now the elevators when we're going to glue all the hinges in but we can start with any one of them doesn't matter the slots are plenty wide clear off some of the monocoat so that'll slide in and out now I like to do this and you could do this with epoxy I like to slide some of that down in there we, because we have some of this on the barrel we could work that around but as soon as I feel it start to kick off I want to make sure I got plenty of glue on the hinge there it goes as soon as it starts to kick off and work this back and forth so I don't have any in there now epoxy is fine, thick CA is fine if you use thin C80, the odds are good you're going to get some in the barrel. And you got to scrape it off with a knife blade and everything. Because you, the one thing I would think is critical on all of these, on any plane, is having nice free hinges. Now I would want to definitely check that every one of these is free. We don't have any bind in it anywhere. That one's got a little bind, we'll just work it out and scrape the extra CA off the barrel if some gets on there. But pretty much now each one of these hinges is in nice and solid. Now the next step is to relieve. We need a notch in here for the horn so it can go through its full travel and a little bit of a clearance here so that the horn the horn shouldn't sit on the end of this it should be recessed in just a little bit so that the hinges sit right in the middle and it takes a little bit of a notch like that to do it now here's one of the things that can be a little tricky or a little difficult I have the hinges just pressed in but also the horn isn't really touching I've got a little bit of a gap now the reason is when I when I go to full deflection normally I want to have full deflection at about well oh, between 30 and 45 degrees so that's plenty 
Now I can minimize that. If I press the horn in any tighter, I'm going to lose some of that control. Now since nothing's glued in, I want to have that, that setting to be when my hinge line shuts, and we're going to fly this, we'd never even consider flying any plane without taped hinge lines. Do not omit that step, especially if you're looking to have competitive performance. But now that, that gap is now set in my little bushing. Now I can just drop some thick CA, thin CA in here, and that sets the bushing in place. Now with the bushing set in place, then I need to drop one drop of CA on each hinge and set the hinges. Now, you really don't want to have the, the CA go on the hinge. I try to get it dropped right on the corner and it wicks its way in. That seems to be the best way to do it, is get it right on the edge of the, the crevice there and just let it wick its way in. Now you can see we built up some three or four coatings. I took some of them covering away so that I could get a better glue joint. That's just thick CA. But that now you also could use the little the fillets help this too, but I like to have those little bushings in there. And because again, we're using this like a taxi cab. I anticipate getting a lot of flights on this plane. So you may you may get away without using those at you know, you know, on a Spain you're only gonna fly once a weekend or something, but this one we're not. Now, the thing I found, and we're ready to glue the hinges in now, nothing is binding up yet. But what I found works well. When I've tried to glue right on the hinge, what happens, it seems like anyway, that a lot of it gets in the barrel. So what I do is I go, let me get this up close. I go along the edge of the crack on both sides and let it wick in. As Soon as it wicks in, then I kind of squeeze that hinge. And keep moving it. May have to get in there and scrape that off because the ultimate thing here is we want to have real we want the control smooth and you don't want to wait until you're ready to fly the plane to do this. You don't want to fly the first flight and you got a ratcheting control system. Now, and this may be, you know, how big the slot is so it's, it's easy if nothing else you're sealing up the slot. I'd be thinking if you just seal up the slot, enough is going to get down by the hinge. And while the, while the CA is kicking off, just I call this babysitting, just keep moving the controls. Now once you know all the hinges are in solid, and I mean, be, pull this apart and see if the hinges are in solid. They are. The horn should be there solid. The last step, okay, everyone is in. The last step on this is going to be, and I'm real fussy about having smooth controls, and especially when you put hinge line tape on and then you think, oh, they're, they're binding up. Five flights later, the binding goes away. Hinge line tape on an ARF is a critical thing because by an ARF's very nature it's a little heavier than it would be if you made it with your custom uh, you know custom wood or whatever it's it's made with the best wood available or if you keep in mind it like some of the ARFs that come from the Ukraine or semi ARFs whatever we're gonna call them where they're half built or fully built those planes are in the three thousand dollar range this is 150, it's just a little bit different. So you've got to do a little bit of the, the legwork on this with some of the common sense things that most people would, would know would be you need smooth controls. If there's no other part of the model you spend a little extra time on, the controls. Now what I do is, and I'll give this a couple of minutes. You can do it that way, do it this way. Just work that for a minute or so and you'll see the controls will just work their way right in. The WD-40 is capillary and we won't put the hinge line tape on until the plane is completely assembled but now what we're going to have to do is pretty much the same exact thing we did here except do it at some future. I don't know what the next step is. Maybe it is the next step. We got to do it as well. We're going to go by the rule, but I'm just thinking this is exactly the same thing because I don't want to repeat it over and over again. But when we put the hinges, the flaps onto the back of the wing, we're going to use exactly the same technique. And so we won't have to repeat it. We won't have to be redundant about it. Now at some point in time, those controls, when you work them, they should, they should be very free. And if they're not, Another, if you've got a little binding in there, one of the things you can do is just 
or watch a TV show or something, or watch, watch one of those fabulous windy videos and work the controls, but you want to break them in before that first flight. You do not want to have sticky controls on the first flight or misalign controls. And this is a big step. This is one of the things that even if you've, even if you've not flown a model in a long time, it's going to make or break the model is the quality of the hinges being free and everything being in alignment. Now these line up pretty well. So we've got the alignment good, we've got the hinging good, the horn good. This is, this is a very nice uh, assembly right now for our model. Now again, I'm really, I'm really fanatical about getting these controls nice and smooth. But the last thing, and this is, this is an important thing before we install a tail, because once this is in the fuselage, it's going to be difficult to see the alignment on the elevators. Is look down, I'm just trying to show this, and see that you have, that these are in perfect, and I mean perfect alignment. That is really a critical thing. And that tail, now we're ready to put the tail in when it comes to that step. And I try to sight it in a lot of different ways to see. Now, keep in mind, a lot of times, looking at it from that way, a lot of times you can have this horn in perfectly straight, and after you put the hinges in, it'll move just slightly. So it's always good, just give it that eyeball test before you go any further. That's a, that's a critical test right at this point. Now, it could be that, that one of two things has happened. We've got We've, we're missing in the hardware pack, we have the push rod, but we only have one ball swivel link. And I don't understand why. I've looked carefully, but we have two push rod ends. So I don't really know if this is supposed to have this. In fact, I'm going to have to find out. But because I want to finish this, and I have the rest of the day to finish it, I'm trying to, I'm trying to work in my... I don't want to sit and wait a couple of days to get a replacement ball link, and it's the weekend, the hobby shops aren't open. I can't even run down and get one. So what I'm going to do is improvise and put a normal end on one end of the push rod, but this end would get, it's very important, we're going to have this at the tail, is to clean the inside of this, get scratch this up. Everything needs to be scratched and then JB weld. Exactly what it says to do on a drawing, except we're only going to use this on one end. And then of course thread the ball link on. So this is the first little glitch that we've run into, and, and it may be that this is just, because this is a pre-production one, maybe, maybe this is just a problem in this one and not with the rest of them, but if they do have ball links on both ends, but, but what I'm reading here, and what, what came in the kit, or in the ARF, is two just slightly different things. Not a deal breaker, and again, a lot of people are not going to want to use ball links anyway. They're going to want to make a regular push rod. Some people are going to fall in love with ball links. So, Rather than make a deal out of it, I want to get moving on this project. I'll get the JB Weld mixed up. This needs to be sanded. Get in there and sand it good. Put it in. Give that a couple hours to dry. Now our good friend Bernie Trent gave us these little sanding sticks, which look just about perfect to get in there. Grind away some of that material. In fact, if I just get this off one side, the rest will go right in. You need to scratch that up. And even though this has these little ridges, I'd feel safer. In fact, I'm going to wrap a little extra carbon fiber on these because I always think redundancy. Again, we're going to use this like a taxi cab. If you're just using this for a sport model, that's probably really overkill and it won't matter. And also, I've got a little bit of Brodac thinner as they recommend. Get that perfectly clean before the JB Weld goes in there. In my case, because I'm going to put a little carbon fiber on the outside, I also, boy, you get goop out of there too. Again, these arrow shaft ends, push rod ends, these are all like, like buying a pair of shoes. What works for one person sometimes doesn't work for the other person. And believe me, when you think of the thousands of thousands of things that have to go into the making up of one of these products, just the fact that we got one little baby speed bump here, it's almost inconsequential. A JB Weld is one of those products every modeler should really have. 
thousands of uses in the world of modeling. The only thing I would suggest is if you have two choices, there's quick dry five minute JB weld and long dry, which is about 45 minutes, you're probably going to be a lot happier with the result of a 45 minute the long dry. And it also gives you a little work in time. Now we want to take that push rod that has the one end because we're going to have to improvise here. This is one of the things we, we're going to need to do. And let me just get this threaded on there. And this is another one of those steps that you can't, if you get this wrong, it's a real problem. And when people have a ball link failure, it's almost always that they've done something wrong, not sanded inside the part, or not gotten. The, in the past, what would happen if the fit was too tight, all the JB welded squeeze out. Well, now with those little ridges, there's a lot less chance that's going to happen. But even so, I kind of worked that in. Now what I'm just going to do for my own, and again, it's a little security. I'm going to take a little bit of carbon fiber, and before this is even dry, I'm going to wrap this with some carbon fiber tow and CA so that there's no chance that can pull out. Again, I just tacked that on now. I'm waiting for it to dry. Thin CA. I'm wrapping this maybe out an inch or so. Then wrapping it back. Now I want to go up over the part. Some amount, anyway. Again, for a, a model flown on weekends, might not... In fact, I'd say probably definitely not necessary, but... You're making a taxi cab. Now, just a few drops of thin CA on that, and a little light sanding, and you've got a, a really good redundancy system. And now what I'm going to have to do is the other, and, and I'm not sure that there just isn't a mistake in the directions here after I read it four or five times. Maybe what they want you to do is put the other end, there are two push rod ends, so maybe it's just that I've read the directions incorrectly. But, but again, this is the whole reason for having pre-production models and then production models, so when these things actually go into production, all these little kinks are ironed out. Now, even if you were doing a traditional ball link, uh, that, that may be a decent way to do it. I just... I know a lot of people have had these pull out when it's done incorrectly. When it's done correctly, it's not a problem at all. And I'd seal that up with a final coat. Of th that, that's just going to be a real good redundancy. I'm, I'm happy the way that worked out. And I'm not sure that's the way it's supposed to be, but one of the things we're going to have to figure out here very soon. Because we really do want to get this flying tomorrow. That is really one of my priorities. We're in this, this incredible, it's right before Christmas, and there's a time window. We have the next, actually today is one of the days, tomorrow is in the 60s. It's an incredible chance to fly this, get it trimmed, get some DVD shot. Because this is, a, this is certainly one of the things we're going to have with us for a long time to come. It's another thing to keep in mind, you never want to have this just hanging off by one or two threads. I want to have at least half of that threaded material on there, at minimum of half when we start doing the alignment. And I'm just cleaning this up. Might be a good way to do all ball links in the future if somebody's going to use them. I'm not sure. Anyway, that's a cheap, re kind of invented on the fly here. That's a cheap redundancy system. And I think that's one that I'd sleep better at night, even now, before the JB Weld is, is not even dry. That's, that's not coming out. But now on the other end, we're going to put that other, 
the other side of the uh, push rod. So I'm just for my own notation because we do want to do upgrades on these things. That's a question mark. To a, now to attach this end, it's going to be a little tricky. I'm going to grind those little notches in here just like they did on, and I'll do that with a Dremel tool. But I don't know the final length yet. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to do the assembly the next couple of steps, figure out what my length is, get everything in neutral, and then tack this. And then figure out, then put the JB weld and whatnot in there. But it's, it's just making this a little tricky, but it's still, it gives you another choice of a way to do it. Now, because the kit came with, the, the ARF came with, with two of these, I'm not sure that isn't the way they wanted to do it. But it's, it's one of the things that I haven't, I haven't really figured out yet, looking at the directions. So I roughened that up. Now, I'm going to take the other end of the, where's that, was the push rod? Take the other end of the push rod and roughen that up inside and out because I want to basically do the same thing I did with the, uh, I want JB Weld on the inside or maybe I can do this on the outside, I'll have to see. This I have to leave uh, the jury out for a few minutes here. But before I can go any further on this, I need to know the total length. So I need to be able to have this adjustment. Again, get everything set and neutral. I really have to improvise this as I go. And it may, again, because this isn't as clear as I probably should be, but, but what's going to happen, I'm sure John will upgrade this and put this into the things that, the little additions to the directions, maybe a little section on how, you, how he wanted to handle this. But the next thing is to find where neutral is on this push rod. Now there's a couple of things we really have to address before I put the flaps on the wing. And, and I'm doing this a little out of sequence, but this is a critical, absolutely critical thing. Where this belt crank is, it goes through little, the lead outs go through little copper bushings, and I want to put, this is motorcycle chain lube. Let me just show this on the, this is going to go in as a liquid and then turn to grease. You want to grease those lead outs and push rod before we go any further. And this is the way I can get in there. There's also another thing I noticed is the way this bell crank is mounted. And because these are not my controls, I'm not real familiar with how this, let me get this over here. Uh, what, what I think is going to have to happen is the nuts that hold this in place look like they're hand tight. I'd like to make them tighter than that. In other words, the one around a bell crank is done with and that's actually a good way to do it. I'm not critiquing the way they've done these. But what I am critiquing is I want to make sure where, see the nuts that go up into the plywood. Let me go over this. This, this is really a critical thing. Where the bolt goes up into the plywood, they've put a nut. But there's nothing keeping the nut from getting loose. And as we use this model more and more, I want to get some epoxy, some glue, something in there so that nut can't rotate. Now if you look down in there, you see how that, where that nut is? Okay, and then there's a nut up here. Well, I want that nut to be in some epoxy or some glue as a redundancy, and I want to see if it has a nut on the other side. It looks like all it needs is some epoxy or glue and it'll be fine, but I, these, these are locking nuts around the bell crank, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a fine way to do it. That's not going to be an issue. What's an issue is, if that bolt up there comes loose, it could be dangerous. And so I would, number one, make sure these bolts are a little more than hand tight. Get in there with the forceps, and then put some epoxy, CA, something in there. That, that would be a good safety thing, in my opinion. And, may, you know, what probably would, 99% of the time, the person that flies this is never going to wear that out or make a problem. But when you look at something that may last year after year after year and, and hundreds, maybe even thousands of flights later and some rough abuse flying over grass, I'd want that as solid as I possibly could make it. So step one is I'm going to get in there with some thin CA as step one, harden that whole thing up, get plenty on the bolt. Wouldn't hurt. Actually, this is actually not a bad thing because we can soak all the joints around the mid-spar area, too. That'll add a little strength with almost no extra weight. Just float some thin CA in there. 
Now the bottom bolt I've got to look at. It's a little different. Now luckily, this is the kind of thing that that you can still get in here. And step one will be to get it tight. Okay. Now once it's tight, drop on a little CA on that. That's a critical one. That's that's something uh, that should be checked every time you build one of these. And I want to get in there and put a real, a nice big glob of thick CA over the top of that so there's no way that can loosen up. Just let that cook. And so I buried the nut, absolutely buried in thick CA. Same thing with the nut on the other side after I tightened it up. And I just double, double check that, that everything, we've got a little bit of play in the bell crank, but that's about the amount you need. That should be fine. But I was just concerned with these nuts and bolts. And that's really well done. That, that's, that's not going to break now. I don't think that's going to be a problem. Let me just go back down in there. And they're buried now. Buried in... Thick and thin CA. Anyway, that's one of the things we uncovered that I think on future ones or on production ones that'll be not an issue, but it's something that you really want to check and you want to be doubly careful. And I'm sure John, as he's as he's making the next the next production run, will want to make all these little improvements. But if you have one of the original ones, that's one of the things you're going to want to just check. None of these things are big deals. It may, may not even be a problem if you didn't do anything, but it's nice if you treat everything like it's going to last forever. At least that's how I would like to do it. Now, because of the way we, this whole assembly evolved, and by the way, the, the leadouts are wrapped real nice, too. What's, what's appropriate now is exactly, and I won't put another 10 minutes on is I'm going to attach the flaps and the horn because we're going to need to do that assembly and figure out the length of the push rod. So I'll do this part off camera. We'll come back to it at this point in time and we should be actually we're into it over three hours now but but we're coming up on if we didn't have these little issues I think right now we'd we probably spent a half an hour resolving some of this stuff and it's not a real big deal. But that's the whole purpose of doing a video, the whole purpose of adding those additional directions. You want to make a product as good as you possibly can. So without any further ado, let me get the flaps on, get everything moving nice and free, and then we'll come back to this. And definitely another cup of coffee. Because I had done this a little bit different way. My tank is a little thicker, so it didn't fit through that hole, and I didn't want to make that hole any bigger. But John had already realized and had figured it out in the supplemental instructions that you needed to remove some of the nose ring if you're going to take the tank out after you put it in. Well, we already did that, and because our tank is bigger, this way was not appropriate. So I just didn't want to leave that as a confusing issue. That is also in the supplemental instructions, a thing about putting sleeves into the motor mounts. And I didn't want to do this because I wanted to redrill this for other motors in the future, especially for the 90. So this is something you could always uh, just keep in mind. If you're, gonna, if you're basically going to put a motor in and never take it out, you might want to do this. If you want to, in the future, make it that you can change motors and maybe drill different holes in there. Uh, maybe or maybe not, but... This, this is something you need to think about in, on an individual basis. Also, another way to deal with this would be, in the, with, of course, that little hatch comes off the top. If you were having trouble with the motor mounts sinking it, the blind nuts sinking in, because don't forget, this is just like clamp mounts. You could always put a set of aluminum pads on top and thread them or make steel pads. That would be another way to do this. See, what has to happen is when you choose the motor because this this ship is designed for a wide variety of motors widthwise and where the holes are if we were only going to use one motor well this would all be very cut and dry but the the little p 
pads, the little tubes that would normally go in there if you were making a permanent motor installation. Well, if you do it the way I'm doing it, it gives you the option of putting more holes in there in the future and then just put the other another pad on the other side. In essence, you're making clamp mounts. Or the last choice would be you could buy a set of clamp mounts from Brodac or from me and just use the clamp mounting system. A lot of choices, and these are all good choices. None of these are bad. Now, see, for me, the issue was the reason I couldn't use those tubes, and it's, well, it's difficult, it's difficult to, to look at this without drilling those quarter-inch holes. Some of that would have come right out the side of the mounts because on a row jet, they go really close to the edges of the mounts. So again, this is this is a thing for uh, it, like buying a pair of shoes, individual taste. But I think all of those methods would work fine. You just have to figure out which one is going to work best for you. Now, in the course of working on this, and in the course of getting the flaps and elevators and all put together, by the way, that went together just exactly the same as the elevators. But I, I thought maybe I should do a storyboard because there's a couple of other issues in here. Number one, this push rod that comes out, that comes off the bell crank, it's soldered on top, but it's got threads on the bottom, and it's got a nut, but it's not a locking nut. It's just a nut. So here's what I'm suggesting to do, and let me, I think it's easier to do it with a storyboard. Here's the wing top, here's the wing bottom. That is, and there's a spar here and a spar here. There's also a piece of plywood here. This is the wing center. And I think this is one of the things that, that is critical. Now, the way this bell crank mounts in, they've got a piece of threaded rod, and it goes up over here through the plywood. The bell crank rides in here, and, and this is a threaded rod. Now, here's what they did that that I think we can upgrade ourselves. We don't. Have, we don't even even have to wait for them. The standard way is they have a nut here. Now I don't know if there's a bushing in there or not, but this is a standard nut on each side, and that's perfectly okay. The bell crank does need just a tiny bit of slop there. They've got a nut up here. Now the problem is on mine. One of these is a lock nut. One isn't. One is a lock nut. One isn't. Castellated lock nut. So here's what I'm suggesting. I built this whole area up with thick CA, so there's no way this can move up or down. And it actually should have a nut on both sides if this were going to be engineered from the get-go. But we just want to make this as easy to do an upgrade as possible. What I did here is I built this up, this whole area up. This is thick CA. The red is thick CA on both sides. So now I've pretty well got this confined. Whoops. I've got this confined in both both dimensions. But the problem is if one of these nuts from vibration or from time, and remember we're looking to keep this for a long time, starts walking down, this is going to have a lot of play. So what I'm going to do, and I, I've already done it, is I put thick CA on the whole threaded part. I just painted it on with a Q-tip. So in essence, now that bell crank really can't go anywhere. Now, the other problem is the push rod end, and let me do another storyboard. Now, on this particular one, here's our push rod. Now, what happens is it's got a washer soldered over here, and that's the right way to do it, and then it's got threads down here. Well, what happened is it's got just an ordinary nut, not a lock nut. Now, there are ways when you put that nut on, if, you would, if you're doing it from scratch, because I can't get in there and take that nut out right now, you could put that on with, with Loctite. That's one way of doing it. The other way is I'm going to mix up some JB Weld and just JB Weld a big blob right on the end of that. Now, and of course, the bell, the, the bell crank is in here. But... But these are just little things. Now, I looked at another issue, that this, this push rod 
and again I looked at the upgrades and the directions and and some of it it just maybe it just escaped me but there's going to be other ways to do this and the way I looked at doing it well I'm going to show but but I looked at a lot of different ways of doing this and here's what here's the problem is if I put JB Weld on that now I, I'm pretty much done for the day and I want to finish this I want to be flying this tomorrow so what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to look at another way of doing this and and it's not a real big a, a deal to improve this and by the way make sure you cut notches rough this up do something to that rod if you're just going to JB weld it in on both ends of course in other words that rod when it comes out to the end if it's smooth and the tube it's in is smooth that that has a tendency to pull out well a better thing would be if it looked like this and the tube itself was rough get in there and scratch it any way you can roll up some sandpaper or whatever rough is always better this and these are engineering upgrades that that aren't going to be a real difficult thing to do but but in my case what I want to do and it's different because I want to hook this up and I want to move right along and the only way I know to do that real quickly is I'm just going to solder it I'm going to put a piece of wire across and solder it if I can't figure out a way of doing that and what that does it saves me the time of waiting for the JB well to dry now these are little brass eyelets that I get from Brodex and I'm going to put little bushings in these controls what I did I bent a little bit longer piece of wire soldered a washer on it this is not anything high-tech I just want to make sure I've got a bushing and then I'm going to solder a piece of wire on the outside I'll wrap this with copper wire for sure these bushings you can get these right from Brodag if you don't have them it'll be a nice tight fit on the wire even though I'd like to have a little bit of slop in the elevators this is going to at least give me a bushing surface so as years go by this, these controls should last a really long time I always use stay bright silver solder no other solder besides stay bright deflux it with baking soda and water this will be one of the upgrades that again a longevity upgrade and I'm not sure you know I'm not sure that the controls wouldn't last two or three years the other way but I know this way they'll last ten and not many of us uh, well I like to have everything last forever, but this is this is a cheap insurance thing that it will. Now, whenever they're done with a solder, this is sulfuric acid. So what you want to do is baking soda and water, deflux all the joints when you're done, and we'll grease them. Now the trick is with this splice, get the bell crank in neutral, get the flaps in neutral. We have a couple wraps of copper wire just holding it in position. I'm just going to tack it on both ends. And then I'm going to wrap some of this with copper wire and solder the copper wire. What happens if you try to wrap this all at once, you just it's hard to get the adjustment. Now what that does, that slop adjustment, that slider, lets me infinitely get the flaps neutral and the bell crank neutral. I want the bell crank and flaps neutral at exactly the same time. You can see where I've got little notches in the end of the wire. I'm going to wrap copper wire in there. And when I solder this, the copper wire acts as a redundancy. I've also got this just tacked in. All I need is one tack just to hold it in place. While I have it in place, before I do the final solder, I'm going to work the controls, make sure I've got neutral. Same amount up, same amount down. And when I solder that washer, I'll take that clearance out of there. But that safety wire it just acts as a safety part. I 
And now with that soldered and that tacked, I need to make sure everything is in neutral now and that I have equal up and equal down. Now with all that soldered in, the next, the last thing is to make sure we don't have so much bell crank travel that this locks in one position. And that's a critical, critical thing because if that bell crank goes more than 90 degrees, it's, it'll snap all the way over. So we don't have any more. That looks pretty good. But if that was to go all the way over, in other words, a bell crank should have some way of stopping. It shouldn't be able to go completely around. And if we did have that, we'd have to put some kind of block of wood in here or some kind of dead stop. But just check that pull full down, full up, and make sure it isn't locking one way or the other. That's an important thing. Now we're almost ready to get the wing installed here, and I need to pull all of the covering back because we need to get a wood-to-wood -wood joint. Now, the way the, the directions say to do this, pretty simple, and actually it's a pretty effective way to do it. And I have my own little technique for lining up the tail, so I'll show that. But the way on the, way on the directions works fine. This way works fine. But you've got to get the joints. The thing to keep in mind here is these joints have to be wood to wood. They cannot be covering to covering. And one of the, the joints that needs to be really accurate here, this joint, as it goes up on the wing, we need to take the monocoat, or I should say covering, I shouldn't say monocoat, and we need to carefully peel this back. This might be well, probably is one of the critical joints of the plane because this is going to hold a wing to the fuselage. And we got a plywood doubler here, so we'd like to try to get this really accurate if I can. Actually, even to the point of building up a little fillet here. Now when you sand this, here's, here's a little trick. Leave the dust there. Don't blow the dust away. The dust is going to help make what amounts to be a little fillet when we actually do go to glue this in place. Now the next thing is I have to get the covering removed pretty much the same as, as what I did here from the middle of the stab. Shows how to do that on the directions. It's just a question of removing that covering. Get the covering removed so when this goes down onto the, onto the wing. Now let's see how, how much we've got to get Here's the wing. This is pretty much of a kind of a snap fit, but it's got to go over that wood. Okay, now as I go to fit this, here's what happens is one side, that side is nice and tight. This side needs to have just a little bit of material taken away. Oh, I'm going to guess not much either. Just the slightest amount. Just take a tiny amount of material off of this edge so that that fit is like a like a notch fit. Okay, what I did, I laid a piece of tape out to show about how much of that material has to come off. It's about a sixteenth of an inch. I use the Dremel tool and I'm using a sanding block to get the last little bit so that this is a tight fit. And once I get that snapping on there, I can do a test fit. If I, if I have to, I just move the tape over just a little bit until that, that part is just going to snap right on.
And here's an ear and area up here. See, we have a little bit of an extra clearance in the back. And it's tight up here. So I want to just take a Dremel tool and just, just take ever so little amount of material off of there so that that fits a little bit tighter. Okay, now that fit is just about how I like it. Now, next step is to attach the push rod, and then this will be ready to glue the wing in. Pretty much from this point, we can just pick up from the directions. What I want to do is tack glue this first, as per the directions. Just hold it in place. I got a little pad because I'm working alone underneath there. I want to get that joint as tight as possible. Then I'm going to turn it up on its edge and redo the whole joint so it's going to tend to wick under and then back. And the only thing to be careful of is if you're doing the top, don't let it wick down out the other wing and glue it to your knee or something. Once that's tacked, and just hold it for a few seconds as that goes off. Once we have this tacked in place, we'll be ready to make a permanent joint. It feels good. Now once I have this and I know it's it's tacked in place and I've got a whole joint of thin CA, now I can kind of just let the thick CA work its way down and make a fillet. The trick is don't let it go out the other end. I've done this and it all of a sudden looked it was leaking down the whole side. Rub it with a few Q-tips and just hold it. That'll take a minute or so to kick off. Now we'll do the other side. Now it's amazing. It's really amazing when you get that joint done, how solid that is. That's, that's one of the impressive parts of this whole thing. That really is pretty solid. Now the next thing is I just have the, ta the, the tail taped in place. I have to remove the monocoat, do the same thing, remove the wood, and then get into the tail alignment. The tail alignment is a critical thing. So the first part of alignment is to make sure as we drop down that the, the tail is disappearing equally on both sides of the wing. In other words, I want the stab and elevator parallel to the wing. Then the next thing I need to do is check that I have the two hinge line dimensions exactly the same because I'm just pinned here I'm not glued in yet now the thing that's important we know that stab and the wing are aligned that way this is tacked in place we know when this is neutral this is neutral and to get you can do the ball link adjustment, or you can just slide this back and forth very slightly to get the two neutrals the same. Just confirm that we have it. And I don't want to have the tail out this way. Very important that the hinge line, the hinge line at the tip is exactly the same. Now we're ready to put a permanent glue joint. Pull out the pins and do a permanent glue joint on that. And all that's left is some little uh, odds and ends pieces. Now the next thing we have to do the same, pull a covering off and then lay out where this covering would go. So, we'd go, so what we're doing in, a set, in essence is joining wood to wood. I can just use thick CA to fill this in. Now one thing I'm going to do as a little modification to the way this normally would be built because I'd like to have an adjustable rudder semi adjustable so I'm taking some little pieces of tin can ordinary tin can and making three little what would be hinges except they're made out of a piece of tin can and I'll be able to bend the rudder and give me kind of an adjustable a, uh, a, a basic easy adjustable rudder without a big problem so obviously I'll put some slits in here put these in place put the rudder in and we're, we're closing in on having this done. This app definitely is going to be done in one day. 
Now you slit this with a little knife that gets pushed in. And I can use that, it'll, it'll really be a nice little way to do it. And what this allows me to do is just put a little bend in there. And if I find a spot that I'm real happy with, I don't want to adjust it anymore, I could put a little piece of tape on that, but having it flexible like that, that'll be fine, I can just bend it. Next step is just pressing in and installing the tailwheel wire, and there's a little cover that goes over this. Again, removing all the plastic so that we get a wood-to-wood -wood joint. And as we're closing in on this, it's uh, it's been a lot of fun putting this together. I think you really could do this in five hours. They claim five hours. I'd be thinking you could do five if you didn't change anything. And if you didn't have any interruptions. Now in our case, we have interruptions, phones ringing and things going on here. Santa's out front. As I say that, my wife yells down, Santa's out front. I'm building arfs. We can't fool with Santa Claus. Look at this action. I'm trying to build my arf and Santa comes by. What the hell's going on here? Holy mackerel. So maybe Santa Claus will bring you an arf too. Unbelievable. I knew we'd get it done today. It's dark, but we're closing in on having it done, and we're going to fly this tomorrow, Santa or no Santa. Santa Schmanna. Okay, that's dry. By the time we get back from checking out Santa Claus, that's solid. Let's get to mount the wheel. I'm going to get all the bottom. Two little strips cut so we can glue that bottom piece in. Grease up the controls for the final time. Next thing is the landing gear. We're working our way forward and hopefully we're less than an hour away from having the, uh, well, <laughs> having Santa Claus come over and give me another wharf to build. Now they say a sixteenth hole for the landing gear. The screws. <laughs> this is <laughs> I have to tell you, this is some of the heaviest landing gear wire I've ever seen. It's probably, it's bigger than an eighth, I think. Heavy duty wire. Now, I had thought of an idea, and, you know, having done, having gotten this far, I can see there's a possibility here that one of the things we could come up with is like a super arf where you would, you could hollow some of these parts out a lot more than they've been hollowed out, and in this case, we could we could mount a carbon fiber landing gear on here real easy. Probably save a couple ounces, among other things. But for right now, this is really this has really been an eye opener. There's some things about the way this goes together that are just really really nice. Some of them, I think, detail improvements will come on future models. We basically, we, you'll, you're never more than one day away if you lost your good plane or if you only had one plane. Thing is, you're never more than one day away from having another plane at the field. The landing gear mounted right up. Wheel collars holding the wheels on in case we need bigger wheels for more prop clearance. I don't know, I'm not sure what that's going to be. We need to put on these little tail fillet pieces. Again, stripping away some of the covering. These just become the fillets in the back. Now before installing this little top cowl cover, I hollowed some of this out just in case we want to fit bigger motors in there in the future. And, and again, possibly that 90 as one of the choices. We need to lay out tank venting. as. Just looking around, there's, there's a lot of little details left, but all of them are five, ten minute things. Tank venting, I'd like to have one overflow vent, and I need to lay out where I'm going to put a uniflow vent. need to think about that for a minute relative to where the motor is and where the tank is going to be. Each installation will be just a little bit different. And the uniflow should always be on the inside of the circle facing forward, so we need to bend up a piece of copper tubing.
and just need to put in an overflow vent. Now we can install, install the engine and tank and tubing. Okay, uniflow vents in there. Overflow vent. Overflow, uniflow, nice and solid. Now the next thing is going to be to drop in the aluminum pads, get the motor bolted back in position. We need to, at this point, look at all the things that are unique to this motor. We need to make sure we have needle valve clearance, we have clearance for all the tank vents and I need to hook the tank vents up, and then cut the cowl openings. I'm looking around, the decal on the wing. Try and make a little list. I don't want to forget any little detail. Then what I'll do is I'll go back to the book and make sure I haven't skipped any steps, any pages. I need to put some tip weight in. But as you get to the end of a project, it really starts to get to be a lot of fun. Now in our case, it'll be easier to set up some of these these tank vent things, get the tubing on, and of course make sure none of the tubings are pinched or kinked or in some way going to restrict us. Just a close up of how I wound up using the venting for a, this is for a road jet, but of course it'll, and this, this tank has a little detent for some of the headers and tuned pipes that I've used that tank on already. Now after the motor is installed, I want to get the tubing going to the engine. Make sure all the bolts are tight. Now I always like to bench run an engine a few times or minimum once on the ground and then retighten all the bolts. That's a good safety tip no matter what, what size motor or what brand you use. Needle valve fits right in. Don't have to cut a hole for the cowl for this. Row jets usually start roughly uh, back out three turns from when they're in all the way, and we'll tighten the cinch nut. But of course, that's going to depend on which brand and which size of engine you're using. Now every, every one of these, depending on which engine you're going to use, is going to be totally different. But I wanted to start with, and you can the way the directions show is fine, I wanted to do this, and I can kind of freehand this. I know I'm going to have to have a, a hole for the head. Let me just look back and see how much of this is going to come off. So I, and I need to be able to choke the engine, so I need to basically get a big hole up here. Now normally I wouldn't, I wouldn't fly the plane with the cowling the first couple times because I'd want to bench run it, go in, tighten the engine bolts, but I want to have the cowling on just so the first flight is an indication of how this is going to fly. My own personal way of doing this is I want to cut a hole so I can get this to start to fit down, but then I can start to look down and see I need to take a little more, a little more, a little more, and I'll put the sanding drum on so I'll be able to get a nice, basically a hole, so another thing too, air has to go in there too, so you, you can't just have a hole for the glow plug. So now I've done a fit and I know I need to open that up just a little bit. In fact, more than a little bit. But I'll go back and forth.
And the best way is just put this back in place, mark where it's a little bit, needs a little more adjustment back and forth. Gonna have to put a little slot in here for the needle valve. Nice little fiberglass cowl. So I can look at this. Now I try to line the screws up just roughly. It's going to come there. I need to have, I'm back the right amount. Huh, what I need is a pen with some ink. Let's see if the Sharpie marker should write a little better. I know I've gone back far enough. Now I tried to allow enough room for cooling, but because of the V-deflector and the air outlets, there should be plenty of air going through there. It looks like it's a pretty nice, neat installation here. Now what I did, I just took this, for, just for safety's sake, left a little more clearance in the back. Or it's going to allow us to use different headers, longer headers. Got enough air going around here. Got all the tubing connected. Need to fit up a spinner. Now I did a couple of checks. It looks like the ground clearance is perfect for a 14 inch prop. And for smaller props, of course, it'll be even better. Want to make sure nothing is binding behind the spinner here. I left extra clearance because I want to be able to fit other motors in here. This is ultimately going to be a motor test ship. Now we've got a couple little odds and ends to do. And this 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 is the point in time where I try not to rush because I don't want to like forget to put the tip weight in. I've got to put some tip weight in this. And I would suggest if you're starting this, start with two ounces. You're probably going to wind up with an ounce and a half, but two ounces. Every once in a while, I just like to look back and uh, see because I, you can bet I'll forget to tighten something. It's always, as many times as I've gone out and, and try to put the push on to fly a new plane on the next day, uh, Joe Adamusco and I have forgotten to tighten a glow plug. We've forgotten to tighten the prop, and among other things. But tip weight, before I forget, tip weight. Now one thing on my model, what was a tight fit, was the flap rubbing up on the side of the fuselage. And I want to have the clearance, so I took a piece of rough sandpaper. This was not binding, but just rubbing and making crazy noises here. I may have to take a little bit of that material away. Just work that sandpaper back and forth. Cut some of the covering material away eventually. Now I would say absolutely a minimum for the first flight. First flight minimum two ounces. That would be eight squares, the little lead squares. Okay, now here's a really valuable little trick when you're using this type of a tip weight box. Over drill, over, make a bigger hole in the tip weights. Because in this case, we need to stack eight of them in there. And I want to be able to, in other words, these holes are not precision drilled. So when you stack eight, like eight slices of bread, the holes don't all line up. If you make them just a little bit bigger, and again, for that first flight, just in case we have something that uh, we have not anticipated but one thing we don't want to have is a big giant lack of line tension until we get our flight trim and we're going to do a little basic bench trimming here but a really detailed bench trim there's a bench trim video so I don't want to just stretch that out we're just going to do the basic and there is if, if you're at a point where you think that would help you uh, we have it it's a dedicated tape for bench trimming a a ship just like this before you fly it. But now what happens is there's still room between the tip weight and the box. And what will happen is if, if you take some of these weights, well if you left all eight of them, these weights are going to start vibrating and they're going to chew a hole in the box or else in, wor in the worst of all worlds, in the best of all worlds, they're just going to be 
that they vibrate all over the place. Now one way is when you finally get the amount that you need, take a little bit of a paper towel like this. Sometimes you can wet it, but you want to make what amounts to be just a little a cushion so that as you press the tip weight the tip weight box down you feel a little bit of resistance see we just have a little bit of a spring action on it and of course we're going to probably take some of that tip weight out but we sure don't want to start on the light side and as a safety thing because I'm always very safety concerned it probably would be a good idea once you get once you establish how much tip weight you're going to want to use, put some scotch tape over this. That just in case the screw loosened up, this won't come out or the tip weight won't come out and possibly hurt somebody. Next thing, just shake that. And if you hear rattling, put some more Kleenex in there. Now that, that type of a tip weight box works well, but you always want to have a redundancy system. You want to have something that you're at the field and a bunch of young kids are there, a bunch of women, a bunch of other flyers, or it doesn't matter. You don't want to have, that's, that's a bullet. When that comes out at 60 miles an hour, and I have seen that in my time of doing modeling. I have seen that come out and go through wings of planes, hit people. It's, it's not, a funny, not a funny thing. That tip weight box is a serious thing. Okay, we look like we got two ounces of weight in there. It's nice and solid. Now one of my golden rules is I never fly a model without the hinge lines taped. It just creates too many possibilities that I'm going to have a trim problem. So what I'm trying to do here, I want to deflect the flap. I'm going to do the flaps and the elevators. And by the way, that is the best, the best way is to do everything. Don't fool around. Now this is one of the tapes that you can use. Ordinary scotch, multitask tape. They do make hinge line tape. That's a tad better. I've never had any problem with this. You want to, while the flap is deflected the opposite way, lay on a piece. Now this is going to make the controls sound squeaky for about 10 flights. They're going to be ee 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 and it's going to make you crazy. But after that point in time, the, the additional performance that you get, especially when a model is heavy, especially when it's heavy, is, is, or especially if you have big gaps and most ARFs do. So this, this is one of the steps I would not leave out. Tape the elevators, tape the flaps. Now I remember when we did the original the Brodak Cardinal ARF, I remember how much resistance there was. People said, oh you don't have to tape the hinge line. And every time I went to fly one and it didn't fly the way I was accustomed to seeing them fly the first thing the first thing oh I didn't think you had to tape the hinge lines so now I'm making sure that I emphasize it a lot of people still don't realize it and in cases where it doesn't add to the performance like on a really light plane when it doesn't add anything it doesn't take anything away either just get used to hearing the controls be a little mushy for six, eight, ten flights. That's worth doing. If you get nothing else off of this whole tape, don't forget that step. Now when you have thick elevators, sometimes it's easier just to use a wider tape. This is just ordinary packaging tape. But the, the whole procedure is exactly the same. Paper towel or something to hold it down. In fact, we'll hold the other side down here. Make it a little bit easier. Make sure it's down all the way. Now if you really don't like the sound of the controls being squeaky and stuff, there's a way you can get rid of it if you, and I would suggest if you're that type of person, you're very conscious of that. When we're all done, turn the plane over, take ordinary pledge furniture wax and spray it into the hinge lines and we'll sit there and work the controls for five minutes. The pledge will work its way down into the hinge lines and what you'll find out is, see the tape is sticking in there for a certain amount of time 
but it's not going to stick there forever especially in hot weather it seems to go away a lot quicker but now we have sealed control surfaces now a little personal safety thing that I always do all my airplanes have one thing in common they all have a forward up line as does this one and I always take a little piece of red wire red tape red anything to mark which is up so that when I connect the control lines I don't connect them backwards I've seen people do that and I figured well I'd probably uh, benefit by learning from their experience and this is just so and because we anticipate a lot of other people getting a fly this now we have a, well, a Rojet 90 test ship that I'll bet a hundred different people have flown already and I know we use it like a taxi cab we use it every day people come to the field they just run out to the handle so what happens is I want all of this stuff as bulletproof as possible and idiot proof and this helps make it idiot proof so I always know my line that connects would have a, the similar piece of little red wire or tape a nice little safety very good safety idea now on the adjustable lead out I noticed that when mine came from the factory the bolts were hand tight but I would want to start with the lead outs back that tends to make the plane more stable as you want more and more turn you can move them forward but for right now I moved them almost all the way back and tightened them up now if you over tighten them they're delicate so you don't want to over tighten it like you're putting a wheel on a Mack truck but you want them to be tight I also take some wheel bearing grease and grease the lead outs any braided lead out tends to wear and you, from time to time should put a little bit of oil or grease a lot of times what I do at the end of a flight I'll find a place on a plane where it is castor oil rub my finger in it just come over and do that to the lead outs at the end of every flight but again when you're looking for thousands and thousands of flights instead of a weekend flyer you need to do that kind of thing now here's something that I think is another one of the little critical things you really have to be aware of what happens is and I was adjusting the lead outs back and forth through their whole uh, range and if I move the front lead out further back than this now normally you wouldn't the front lead out wouldn't go back here that this would be the normal range I think but I don't have any binding in the controls at all when I move the front lead out back past the midpoint and I'm gonna put a little scratch on here it's about about where you really wouldn't move them anyway but be aware as you look inside and I know you can't see it with the camera but it rubs on one of the gear blocks which I think would be a problem in other words the problem would be if you decide you want to have these lead outs all the way back you may have to get in there and somehow grind away some of that gear block but most people are not most people but I'm what I'm gonna do is put a little mark here where I know that's as far back as that can go but another tip off is if you're moving the controls and you'll hear squeak squeak like a violin it's because you've turned a lead out wire into a violin string so this is not something I, I think most people would be concerned with but if you hear a squeaking sound when you're working the controls move that front lead out forward you'll probably eliminate the whole problem now what I did I I squirted some pledge down in the hinge lines just to see how nice these controls would be and these controls have really loosened right up there's almost no noise at all and I'm gonna try to free them up a little bit more before we actually get out to the field because with anything new like this you need to work on it and just as an example just work the controls let that pledge work its way in you probably could use other things like WD-40 but if you hear anything like a violin sound, you know that front lead out is rubbing on the gear block. Now we get to the kind of more fun things, the cosmetic part of this. Now, one of the things I learned when I did the, uh, the Brodak Cardinal ARF, I was uncomfortable with the decal. And I realized I was treating it like a decal, soaking it in water, that was the problem. So again, reading the directions is always the answer. But these decals, if you try to apply them 
in a different way than what's shown in the directions, you run the risk that it's going to be a problem. Now, it's not a problem if you do exactly what they say. You mix up a little dish of soapy water. And I'm going to demonstrate this because this is one of the things I had a little problem. I always leave a little bit of an edge around these decals, too. I'm not sure the right word for these is, is really decals. Probably it's press-ons or rub-ons or, I don't know, spare tires or something. But anyway, I leave myself a little bit of the, the clear around the edge. I don't want to trim right on a black line. It just gets too cute. And when you get to this point, and boy, it's the end of a very long day. This has turned out to be five hours has become Hello Santa Claus. But I don't care. Because the objective was to get this done in one day. I really wanted to see if, you, if that was a practical thing to do, and it definitely is. And if you were not making a lot of these little changes and shooting video and everything, you could probably chop that down significantly. Now, I need to go get some water. You get some water with some couple of drops of laundry detergent or dish water in it. Know about where you want to place it. Let me get the water. So what you do, it's not a decal. You don't soak that in water. You just get this wet with a little bit of that, just a couple of drops of dish detergent, get it good and wet. I want to take, and I peel the decal back. Why am I calling it a decal still? Let's see if I can do this. Make it look like it's easy. It is easy. See, that's why you leave enough of the clear in around it. And of course, if you're going to fly the plane in competition, you would want to have your uh, AMA numbers on the other side. Now you can just squeegee out the water, and as you squeegee it out, it tends to stick down. Now as we come up on the cosmetic part, I have to make a decision here, because we've been working on this all day. One of the things I wanted to do, I wanted to get a little bit of touch-up paint and touch up where I've scratched the monocote off, just, just dull, I guess doll it up a little bit. And tomorrow morning, I want to shoot some photos of it before I actually get down to flying field. I'm hoping some of the guys will be down there, give me a hand. We kept the bench run it. But excited about it. Anytime you've added a new, a new aircraft to your Air Force, it really doesn't matter if it's a, uh, the most elaborate exotic or, or an ARF or an ARC. And believe me, I could think of a project that would really be done. If, if we were doing an, an ARC and totally sand it out and put a whole, like Mike Costello has done that, do a, do a total finish job on it. Now I just got to get some dry paper towels. You could make like a cheater ARC. That'd be cool. Now from this point on, there's really what I call pre-flight stuff, not bench trimming. We've got a whole DVD on bench trimming and locating the CG and things like that, but we sure want to do, before I go to bed tonight, I want to put a, a good pre-flight on this. Go around, tighten things up, work the controls in a little bit more, make sure things like the proper tight, the lead-out guide is tight, that we haven't had any any issues. Now the last little bit of fun, I zeroed out my scale. And I'm not sure the scale is real accurate, but it, it's always been a reference point, for me anyway. Now keep in mind the ship has a little more than normal tip weight, just a little more than we'd expect probably a half ounce. We could deduct a half ounce from this. Let me make sure we're we're balanced. Mm. 
and I'm showing on my scale which may, may or may not be accurate and it doesn't even matter this is not a critical thing much more critical that the, that the ship is going to balance and again we have a flight trim video so I'm not going to get into that right now these are these are basic planes that are just supposed to be right in the middle right now we're not looking for razor edge stuff but anyway mine is showing that with the Rojet and a carbon fiber spinner and a carbon fiber prop we're at and two ounces of tip weight we're at 65 ounces now again I'm not sure that it's it's super accurate but again I would allow an ounce for most people will make little spats for these most people have a metal tank that's another two ounces most people have a much, that's a carbon fiber spinner, those are the ones that I make. That's a little bit heavier, four ounces. You're still probably going to be, and, and possibly a heavier engine, the Rojets are light engines. The Possibly you could bring this in realistically at 70 ounces, and that's, that's really good. Now I did a pre little preliminary balance, it's close, it's probably going to need a little nose weight, and if it does we'll just put a standard spinner on. We don't know what prop we're going to wind up flying it with. We could wind up with a heavier or a lighter prop. Again, the hardware can change infinitely. We might want to put bigger wheels on at some point in time. When we put the 90 in, we'll want to turn bigger 15-inch propellers. But And this plane, by the way, for anybody that, that really think this through, this would be an excellent, excellent, if you've not had a 90 in your Air Force and you're looking to experience bigger motors, this would be a great one for it because number one it would fit in between the mounts without a lot of work you got more than enough room for the tank and probably with the 90 this would be an, a 70 ounce plane it would be well within the range that most people get these to come in at and so it's been one day granted a very long day to go from box uh, one thing that's helped is we've had this engine in other planes and we've had this tank in other planes so hopefully we're not going to have to uh, spend half of the day cleaning fuel filters and things like that. Now as after looking this over and because I've been so impressed with the way this came out I have some just ordinary striping tape from a car parts store. See what happened is I have a pretty big gap here and I I definitely gouged too much away there when I opened up the motor this will just cover the hole and since we have the tape this is what's nice about having a a big drawer of spare tape when you have a job like this we can touch it up or any spots that we want to go over so just seal up that area Actually, they'll seal this up too. And I'm going to mix me up a little, little thing of white paint because I want to get in here. I'm just afraid that's going to get pretty oily right away. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. And as ti as tired as I am tonight, and as long of a project as this has been, it's been a very rewarding project. This this has really been a fun day, and we even got to see Santa Claus. Yeah, that solved that problem very nicely. Now I still have a couple little things as I go through the checklist. I retightened everything up, put some jet stickers up on a nose just to dress the plane up a little bit. Still want to touch up all that white. I don't want to get I want to get in there as far as I can with a paintbrush. Touch that up. Actually the whole the whole nose section looks pretty good. I don't have any numbers for the outer wing, so that's one of the things I'm not going to be able to do. I got a set of lines. I would want the lines to be from the middle of the plane to the middle of the handle, 68 feet, 018s for the ship, or solids, 014s. And as I'm coming up on uh, having this model ready to fly, 
I think I owe a little special thanks to John and Buzz Brodeck that make this and many other projects that I've enjoyed and I'm sure the world of control line flying can uh, can benefit from the effort. John, you've really stepped up to the plate on this one. I, I'm really itching to fly it tomorrow. Probably not going to be able to sleep here. I'm like the kid in the Polar Express. I really do think those little side scoops, they need a couple of coats of paint. And I realize after I put two or three coats of paint in here, what I, what I really should have done is just seal it with a little bit of epoxy or some thin CA or something because the paint on these end grain things just soaks right in. But even a little thing like that, little little detail stuff, I don't suspect with this type of exhaust, the rear exhaust engines, you get almost none, no oil on a plane, and that's really nice. That's really a nice accessory feature. And I think when I wake up tomorrow morning, come back down to shop, Get the car loaded, get the cameras out there, tomorrow's photo shoot day, and maybe even first flight day, hopefully first flight day. Anyway, but that's all subjects for another DVD. Hope you've enjoyed this, and please share it with all your friends, and if you have a question, don't be afraid to call Wendy, John Brodak, Rich Oliver, anybody that can help you enjoy the sport of modeling even more. And subscribe to Control Line World. Lots of good technical information. And now before I actually turn in, it's good to kind of think that we've added another chapter into the saga of Strega. And it's gone from being team alternate, fifth place at the Nats, winner of many many local contests gone on to a life of being a test plane it's actually as we make this still in texas being used as a test plane and i think our orf in a lot of ways is following down those footsteps and if there's any area any technical area of modeling that i can be of help with first of all my email address and address are on this tape but Secondly, the world of DVDs, there's over 900 of them now, and every part of it from finishing to the most exotic twin engine planes, building, finishing, the Brodak fly-ins, the Nats, every one of them is documented. And now we've added to that what I think is going to be a very informative and good DVD to have. It showed a lot of little a lot of little things you might want to check or modify when you put your ARF together. And certainly I hope you're gonna have as good luck with yours as I'm having with mine. I had a really a really fun day putting this together. And and this is the thing that was never possible in the past. Never was possible to go down to your hobby shop or mail order, get a box, stay up late that night, and the next day be ready to fly. And on our next tape, we're going to be flying this. This, this is, it, It's brought back some of the fun of modeling to me. I mean, I get involved in, and, and just as an example, very high-tech carbon fiber, one-of-a-kind planes that are that are extremely labor intensive to design, develop, and build. And then when I come back to something like this, I feel like I'm coming back home. I feel like the kid that's coming home to his hometown, and there's the old house where he grew up, the old tree fort. It's brought me back to my roots. And in a lot of ways, I think it's going to do the same for you. And I hope we'll see you on other DVDs. In the meantime, I need sleep. All right, it's a dark, gloomy, cloudy day, but they said it's going to get nice. They lied. I don't believe it. We didn't luck out yesterday. Rich is here getting the field ready. we got to organize our barrels. The kids have been here having parties. It's going to take us 10 or 15 minutes to get ready. We want to ground run this first while Rich is here. I'll fuel it up, 
get it ready for a ground run, then we'll check that all the bolts, the prop, everything is tight. It's been an exciting past few days getting this ready and uh, trying to take advantage of what they predicted to be reasonable nice weather right here before Christmas time, but boy, you never do know. You know in the northeast, look at that sky. You, you can't tell if it's going to be nice this time of year or not. But we would like to get at least a test flight on, at least a ground run, and maybe a few flights and get some basic idea of how this plane is going to trim out. And again, Mike Costello is supposed to join us here. Now here's what really matters today. Karen made me up this eight cup thermos of blazing hot coffee. Yes. And I thought it was going to be a lot warmer, but I don't care. You know, you get your blood boiling. I want to get a flight on this thing. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to take the first flight, I'm going to put the camera on a tripod. The Doran 14-4-4 blade, Scott Dinger muffler and header. It's three blade. Roger, three blade. Get your glad I know what I'm doing. <laughs> we're excited. And this will be the absolute first flight of the Strega ARF.
I guess if you've been watching this, our session is over. You cannot believe what's happened. We're, we're changing props and doing things in between flights. And all of a sudden we have migratory birds, like 10 million birds fly by. I don't want to take a chance on crashing a plane. This is unbelievable. I never seen any, even for us this is unusual. Look at this, did you ever see more birds in your life? Look at the birds. Now Mike, Mike Estella stopped by today. Look at this action. Mike Estella, I can't believe it. It's, those aren't leaves, those are birds. Look at them go, look. I'm, I'm really not gonna take another flight. The day is over. I, they, they, we almost hit a seagull on the first flight. We had a seagull come into the circle. Mike's experience, it. Mike comes over, we were going to fly Mike's prototype Strega. Oh, look at this. Look at him. Look at him. They, you can't fly here. Mike brought the other Strega out just so we could compare him. He made some changes to his. But look at this action. Holy mackerel. This is like an Alfred Hitchcock movie. <laughs> and I love birds, but I, I'm not sure this is a time. I think it's time to cut our losses. Look at him go. Look at this. Is this wild? The whole field. I would guess there's 20,000 birds here right now. It's gone the whole length of the field, too. Even back down here, the trees are just filled. Look at them go. Look at this. Oh, it's starting to look like lunchtime, huh, Mike? <laughs> Holy mackerel. Anyway. So how many flights do you have on this Strega now? Uh, about 45. You got 45. And so far, the problem, well, not a problem, but You've obviously made a trim tab out of the wing to level a wing. Right. It looks like this wing is pretty level, but I'm not sure because we only have a few no, flights yours on is it. level. Did it look level in flight? It looked, it looked like the insides and outsides. You didn't have any less tension. I was doing them over and over so you could see it. Yeah. yeah. Except those birds were getting. <laughs> I was thinking about that seagull. Well, this thing I think has walked back because now it's light on outsides and uh, oh, okay. stronger on inside. Well, flip it over. I want to see how you got that. This has got a Tiger 60 in it. Yes. Okay, that fit in there real nice. That's super nice, in fact. Tongue muffler, one of my old tongue mufflers. Yep. Runs good in that nose. The one thing about this plane, it does have a solid nose. I, I will give them credit for that. Did you weigh it? it all it's up weight? Right now, two ounces of tail weight and about an ounce and a half in the tip. It's 68 and change. 68. Why did it need two ounces? I, I can't believe it needed to get it to turn. Uh, this, that's... Then, then we carved the leading edge. And it turned better? And now we think we can take some of that tailwind. I think so too. Plus, we did, it was pulling me so hard, I couldn't concentrate on maneuvers. I got two ounces of tip weight in there. I mean, tail, tip weight. Only because the first flight, you know, I want to be ready in case something happened. Well, yeah, but it was always, pretty uneventful. We always start like that. I yeah. Think, I think we can take some tip weight out. Yeah. I this think, is a I good idea. Some tail weight this out. seals the wing lead. This, this is an excellent silicone. idea. No, I mean the tape is no, a good idea. No, that's not tape. That's the top of the monocoque. Oh, well, okay. But it is there was a big this is a big area of air leaking through. You you're losing lift here. Yeah, we used the uh, I used that uh, You use hinge line tape? This tape is the tape uh, it's the Dupro tape. It's RC hinge tape. I got so it's good too. It's yeah. Excellent. So yeah. It's like rubber in it. Yeah. I use all the 3M and Staples tape, but just because I wanted to get this out to the field. So this is good. All right, and you made an adjustable trim tab. Yeah. Well, you know what'll be fun is having a little fly off here when we get some weather. The, uh, we need some weather though. And you made a hatch. You made this hatch. Look at this tail weight. I, I can't believe it would need that much tail weight. But you know what it could be? It could be you have a very light tail. It could be that. It could be because we moved, shifted the wing back a quarter of an inch. That could be, yeah. Yeah. Because look at... Well, if this is a... If you're building, especially an ARC, just radius that leading edge off. So we played with the lead-out sweep back and forth. Okay. And if you move the lead-outs all the way back, there are some vertical members in here. It yeah, it rubs. This, if you move this lead out back on mine more than about halfway, it turns into a violin. It goes, right. Ee, ee, right. you got to keep, so you, but normally you wouldn't use that range. Well, there's some vertical members that can be dremeled away. Well, you could re, well, yeah, if you cut a hole and just pop. Well, I mean, if you had an arc. Yeah. Well, you do that before. If you have an arc, it's the front lead out that can't rub on. There's a little block in there. Right. But when you get it in the wrong position, it just turns into a violin. I put that on the, the DVD for uh, working on this. 
And the 60 worked. I know a Tiger 60 flies these fine because that's what I had in the original one. And there's no problem with that. Uh, it was just pulling me off my feet. We wanted to lighten it up on the lines. And uh, so we were 68 around. ounces is a good weight. Now that's 65, but, but it's not a. I mean, if it was 70, it wouldn't be a problem. That yeah. wouldn't be a uh, no, like a deal breaker or something. It wouldn't be a problem. This wing in this wing area is capable. Oh yeah. Not a wing loading. Problem. Now the one thing they did that it's it's really not to everybody's advantage, but it's to my advantage. The 90 fits right in there. <laughs> you know, like making those little motor spaces. No, that that 90 will be in there very soon. Cause I see, I'm just afraid Jose's plane is gonna, you know, it's the nose is gonna come off or something, but it hasn't yet. But. But it's well, we're learning. It's real good now. About four or five different people flew it yesterday. At okay. Orders. Everybody liked Everybody's, it? Or? It was all ballpark for everyone. Okay. Brian said he would change a few things. Yeah. He, but you trim a plane to suit you. When, right. If Paul Walker flies this, he's going to make it tail heavy. He's going to have it real sensitive. Sabatino's going to fly it or Peabody. It's going to be nose heavy. And it, that's a personal thing. But I, can't, I, you know what? I feel stupid. I didn't bring my stuff for the two-bladed props. And this is going to wind up needing a prop with a lot of pitch. That motor wants to run so slower RPM, so, but, you know, the problem is they predicted three real nice days here, and you know what? We, we got juiced. We got birds, we got, yesterday, Jackabone couldn't even hold his plane when we were trying to take pictures. The plane was blowing away. We had to go up against the building, so, I don't know. I think we've been cheated, but, and it's supposed to get cold tomorrow, so at least we got some flights, and, uh, you know, the, the point is to live to fight another day something else we did. We cut that bottom piece off of the spinner ring and glued it to the cowl. Yeah. Uh, I just got rid of mine. I'm not I'm not worried about the cowl at all because I'm thinking when a 90 goes in there. No, you may not have. But this this worked out great. You can, yeah. you can yeah. choke it. There's enough. Oh, mine, the, the cowling was a, no problem at all. And you can't make it a lot lighter than that. No. Even I can't make it lighter no, than nobody that. Nobody can make it count. Like but if you made this an arc, this, this block here you could hollow out. There's stuff underneath. You could just take a Dremel tool, and if, if you want, you could pull two, three ounces of, of dead wood out of there. But it, you know what it is? If if you start out and look at this like it's going to be a Ferrari, you can't go to the Ford dealer and buy a Ford Escort and say, say it, it doesn't have it a, Ferrari a Ferrari engine. I'll make yeah. it into a Ferrari. At some point in time, reality has to enter the picture, and that's, I, th I think the reality is maybe 70% of the people that are going to fly this It'll be perfect. And the other people, they can modify it anyway. They they can sand the leading edge and fine tune it and put a tune pipe in it or whatever. Well, we're learning. Little by little, we're learning. Between you and me. If it's well, we got that first day at the field under our belt, and you can see from some of the little outtakes I took from the flights, we we had a very eventful first day. We had bird migration. On the first flight, we had a seagull almost take the plane out, among other things. We found out a lot of things, and these are all going to apply to the ARF. Probably if you're building one or putting one together, and Mike joined me with his, another one of the prototypes that he was working on. They made some changes. Now, Mike's wing needed a big trim tab to straighten it out. Mine didn't. Mike's wing had incidents in it, and I'm going to check this to see if mine does or not. And that could be a random thing, a piece of warped wood or something, and I'm not sure. One of the things I came away from, and this is why I needed to get a day of flying, I can't really shim my tank anymore in this without, because my tank is a different shape than the tank that really should be in here. So what I'm going to do is make an additional set of thicker aluminum pads so that it, it was running richer, inverted. So that'll hopefully make that a little bit better. The controls seem to free up right away, and in a matter of a few flights, the controls have gotten freer. But again, if I move that lead out, the front lead out, any further back than that, it rubs. And so the choices would be if you're building an ARC, get in there and knock that piece of wood out, or on one of these, cut a hole in the bottom. I don't have a monocoat gun. See, what limits me, I don't even have a, I don't even have a real monocoat iron. And I could tighten up all the covering on this as soon as I can get George or somebody to come over with their monocoat iron. But the overall thing was, it the wing was really level. Now Rich checked the wing several times, so did Mike. Looks like that's in the bank. 
And so the things we got to work on, one of the things I got to make the little pads, I'm trying to make a little list in my mind, the little pads for the motor. I need a heavier spinner, my carbon spinner, and Mike's needed tail weight. Now that's strange. Mike needed tail weight, mine needs nose weight. I'm not sure what that's all about. Mike had the better hinge line tape, which I, sh I wish I would have had. And I have a couple other little modifications that I think, or what I'm going to do is detail every one of them, of course, for all my subscribers. Because I think a lot of the little things that you can do, there will be very little effort to make this really a ton better. But it's pretty good to begin with. And I think for most people that are going to be building and flying ARFs, this certainly is is going to be adequate and for the people that want to make it a little bit better we'll try to cover some of that as we go along. So first day ends and I think the winner today clearly was the birds. If you can, if I don't know how some of that footage came out but they were just birds, they just blew us off the field. Some kind of migration was going on or mating season or something. Man I got blown away, literally blown. Okay so we're going to go through our Basically, throughout, well, what would be a smart thing to do, even if we weren't going to do anything, would be to pull everything apart, make sure we don't have any loose bolts, any, any issues with that. We know we need the two-blade prop with more pitch. We need a heavier spinner, and I have to go through my spinners. We want to shim the motor, among other things, and I want to make a little dead stop in the back. I made myself up a little list while I was having coffee. So I would know exactly what I want to do here, make a methodical list, and get this ready for its next its next test day. I don't think that's coming because the weather is already changing out there today, but we're going to take what we can get. Now I'm trying to make a list of the things that I thought worked fine and things that maybe didn't. Well, we know, and, and this is really, a lot of this is in our favor. The, the, the rubber extension we had on here was choking the engine too much. Got rid of that after the first flight. The, we know that we need heavier hardware up in the front, which is a big plus because what it means is and I'd, I'd have to do, I have to figure out how much extra hardware I need, but it may, it may mean that I'll balance right where I want to be with a 90. Now, I don't know why, but my Costello's needed two ounces of tail weight. This one doesn't. This one probably is going to need an ounce, ounce and a half, and I have heavier spinners, but I want to use a long pointy spinner just for the look. I don't want to use this carbon fiber spinner because if we need nose weight I want it to be I want the weight up here I don't even want it to be a, a, a flywheel I want it to be all the way up in a tip and a long pointy spinner lets me get the weight as far forward as possible and that's an important thing to realize because the further forward you put the weight what happens you need less and less weight and I think I have I have to check all my spinners I have one that will probably be an ounce heavier or maybe an ounce and a half heavier so that will be step one so the first thing is on a day like today I want to take everything apart anyway. I want to see if I have any loose bolts, any any other issues that I need to deal with. I have to take the motor out anyway. And the spinner probably is not going to line up exactly then. But I need, because of my tank being in here, I can't really shim my tank. I'm on the mounts already. So I need to move the motor up. And one of the things I thought might be a, an issue after the first day of flying I thought I'd have some loose bolts. I don't have any, and that's a good sign. Now, one of the things we came away from this, at least totally convinced, the, for sure, and this is not a maybe, for sure, the nose section on this plane is absolutely bulletproof, and there'd be no reason not to be able to put the 90 in here, assuming we, we want to get to that point, but we do want to fly it with this motor first. We're hoping. Now, Mike made some interesting observations in the time he had his he's got a lot more flights he's got 40 flights on his and we're, what what really will work to our advantage is and Richard Oliver is already building his if if we share information and get all the aggregate of things that work and don't work get it to John maybe he can put those changes in the next production run but in the meantime we'll have a DVD outlining and none of the changes are they're all relatively simple things that I think anybody can uh, like smoothen out the leading edge that looks like a, probably a good idea. And if you look at the Strega plans, that's a good idea of, of how much I radius the leading edge on the original plane. So having that original plane and knowing it's a top five plane, it gives you a database to work from. Now you can see there's not a drop of oil in here. Perfectly dry. But it was rubbing up here. So I need to grind a little bit more material away here so that the header isn't hitting. Just want to get rid of that material. 
that'll take care of that. That's one thing. I need to plug off the tank vent. Now you can see I'm down as far as as far as you can go. So the only way to get this shimmed is I'm going to make another set of pads, and I have extra aluminum pads, and it's going to in essence raise the motor up to try to get the engine. And I guess you could see right away from the first flight. Once that shim is off, now if you build a plane, of course, I wouldn't have, this this piece of plywood wouldn't be there, but I don't want to go in there and take that out, because the nose is so nice and solid, and probably on a 90, when when we go to test the 90, having that nose nice and solid like that will be a big asset. So what I have, I put all up the Spitfire hardware, because this is going to go back on a Spitfire, and I'm going to set up a whole new set of hardware, a heavier spinner, heavier prop, now, it's just ironic that Mike's plane needed all that tail weight, I, and I, I don't know how to un define that right now, but, but we're sure going to give it some consideration. The planes have different wood, but for instance, I wouldn't want to be running a super light spinner and a nose weight. Why not just put a heavier spinner on, because that moves the weight further forward anyway. That's my logic anyway. And the more weight, the more leverage arm you have, the less total weight you need. Now, Mike's was 68, mine is a little bit lighter, but with the heavier spinner, they'll probably be both around 68. Now, just giving myself a little more clearance in every dimension here, because I know I'm close, oops, I know I'm close on that header. And then I want to seal the whole edge of this, just to keep raw fuel from getting in there. Now every, every motor installation, of course, is going to be different, and I'm using up some old CA that Rich brought over here, and we use old CA to seal things because it gives you a little work in time. I'm sealing everything back up here. Then I need to drill out and make another an identical set of motor mount pads, and I'll just make mirror images of these, and I'll see if I have a so 16th, or if I don't, I'll use 8th. And if they, they don't work, then I'm going to have to get some thinner aluminum. Because the only way I'm going to be able to fine-tune this tank in this fuselage is with the motor mount pads. Now, I was real happy to see that Mike and Tom Hampshire and Doug Benedetti have been flying the other prototype. And they found a lot of little things. They're going to be adding to our database, of course. But we share the data all the time. And while I had this apart, I just thought because I, again, I'm looking for that long life. A little fuel proofing up here never hurt. Just a couple of coats of Brodac dope. This is where it would get fuel overflow or spillage. Just dress it up just a little bit, make it a little bit nicer. Now I have the original pads that went in there. And an extra set drilled exactly the same way. Now I have to be careful to line up all these holes, of course. Of course, one of the things I could do is put a little wood screw in here. In fact, after looking at this, that may be the easiest way to do this. Well, for this installation, I bet I'm not going to get too cute, but in the future, that would be a good way to hold everything together. In essence, what that does, it lowers the tank. Now, what, what we know now is if you were going to use a Rojet 76, you probably would want, well, only if you're using this tank, of course. But you'd want to lower the tank or raise the motor. Either way, keeping these two things in alignment is what, what gives you that equal motor run. Even if it's, whether it's an ARF or a, a, a kit-built plane or by plans, doesn't matter. Now, don't laugh. In the old days, when you used to have, a, like, a Vico Chief and the tank was glued in, and you wanted to shim it, of course most of the time it was pretty close, the tanks at a day and Fox 35's were pretty close, but like with the sweeper. I built the tank in and then all of a sudden, uh oh, I gotta shim it. Well the nice thing about doing with, with a shim, we could make these plates any thickness of aluminum we want. And if we had to, we could even have custom sizes milled or put shim stock. It gives you a very accurate way of doing it. It's a little bit more labor intensive. But here's the good news. We need the nose weight, so we may as well just put them in. Now, for Mike Estella to do this, it's a problem, because he would need twice of this weight in the tail, if that's the case. But we're going to look at why he needed the tail weight and why we needed nose weight. Um, 
This this part of that I don't understand yet. Thing a lot of people don't under really understand, and when it was explained to me in engineering terms, I wasn't so sure I understood it. But when you add a layer, now we have the nut, the motor, and two sets of shims. Now we have more faces of things that can tend to loosen up. So we're going to have to monitor these bolts now, just in case, of course. And if if we were going only on one, th in other words, if you started adding washers under a bolt, you put 10 washers on a bolt, and no matter how tight you make it, it's going to loosen up. That's why I never use washers under bolts that I don't want to loosen up, even lock washers. I don't use any. And it's, it's the way it was explained to me, and I'm not so sure if it's totally correct, but it seems to work, is every time you add a clutch face, and as you add more and more clutch faces, no matter how tight you make it, they start to slip and loosen up. Not sure if that's totally true, but when I've, when I've done this, and by the way, now we've got plenty of clearance, yippee, it, it made sense to me, and when I did it in practice, see, a lot of these things, in theory, they look good, and then you go to try it, and it doesn't work. But, but this is one of them that in the real world works. Here's a good little tip. When you, when you take these cowl screws out four or five times, they get a little loose. There's an easy way to make that not happen. While the screws are out, just put a drop of thin CA, and it, it makes the screws they're nice and tight again. Now, with the help of the gram scale, <clears throat> this won't really be hard to do as I go through my spinner collection. I used to have this all on a chart marked. I look in the bank. Now, remember, I organized things before this real building season started, and you know what? I don't have the chart here. <laughs> I think it's in the van, but I'm too lazy to walk out. But I'm pretty sure the, the Aero Products needle nose, of which we have a few, and they're beautiful spinners, of course, I think they they're put the weight as far. Yeah, we got one. We got two, in fact. Well, they'll put the weight as far forward as possible, and that's what we're looking for more than anything else, is to get that weight as far forward as possible. Now, we really lucked out on this. This is the heaviest spinner we have, and we had one for a two-bladed prop. But what I'm doing, I'm taking all my extra nuts, titanium nuts, aluminum bolts, threaded rod, things. This, this adds way over two ounces to the plane. So now we're looking at a 67 ounce plane, but hopefully with better balance. Our second choice is the Rich Oliver's spinner is somewhere in between our carbon and the Aero product spinner, but if you need the nose weight, again, it's crazy to put a heavier muffler on a plane when you can get the weight further forward. Now, I can go with a lot of lighter, lighter nut uh, among other things, I have carbon back plates, I have other things that can lighten this up, but right now this package here, I've got the weight as far forward as I can get it, because the weight is in that point right out here, that's a solid point, so that gets my weight way out forward. And that's combined with the heaviest of the props, and we're going to take all our two blades to the field, but that's, that's a significant amount of weight on the crankshaft, now that should get us well, we don't know if it's going to be a final balance, but we know from where we started with all the lightweight stuff, we, would, we had it too tail heavy. But there's another choice we have. If we get a rainy day, we can pull these elevators off in a matter of uh, half an hour and make up lightweight quarter inch sheet elevators and then probably be able to use the light hardware. And, and again, it's that seesaw. If we can get weight off the nose, but right now I'd like to even have the, cho the choice of flying this tomorrow, even if it's cold especially if those birds all go south or go to Houston or wherever the hell they're going. They were scaring the hell out of me here. But spinner doesn't exactly line up, not going to ruin my whole day. But I hope the tank shim now is in, in correction. And I hope we've got the CG a little bit more realistic. And this is the, this is the one thing I'm, I'm not happy with is the gear. Are, I really have to bend those gear just a little bit forward. I have to take them out of the wing and do that because we are See, that, that's no good when a plane stays down like that. that. That's when you chip props. It should be just a little further forward. Now, what's probably tr really true is for a lot of super expert flyers, their rear would CG would be fine, but for the most of the people that are going to get to fly this, our club people and local people, having a little nose weight in there is not going to hurt. And certainly, six. I put it back on a scale, 67 ounces, I'm still an ounce lighter than Mike, but, the, but they're all under 70 ounces. 
And I still have that choice. I remember, see the elevators are relatively thick on this. These could actually be a lot thinner. And I was thinking, I, I know these are heavy. I could tell just by squeezing them. That's good rock hard wood. But if I really want to get some weight off of the tail, if I can get even a half ounce off the tail, and I'm sure I can. Trouble is I don't have a monocoat, uh, a way of monocoating them. And, uh, I may have to invest in all the monocoat materials to do that. But, but then it would allow me to get back to the lightweight parts on both ends. And instead of being 65 or 66 or whatever it was then, I can get it down to 64. And all of that will be a real positive thing. But it's not a deal breaker because a plane like this is not meant to be you know, if you want the $3,000 Ukrainian plane, yeah, it's got a lot more features and everything, but but this isn't $3,000. This gets you to the field in one day, and I think for most people, even built right out of the box, this is going to make a lot of people happy. But Mike had an issue, and I want to look at it now. I want to see if my wing is in level, and I can only do that with my laser level. I got to look at it because Mike said his was crooked when he measured it. Now, it doesn't mean... That the, the fuselage sides were a crooked piece of wood, or that this one is straight or crooked, or that the controls weren't lined up. That's another thing I want to check that I have all the controls in alignment. So I'll spend a little bit of time checking that stuff, and basically, uh, I'm I'm happy the way this worked out, and we got through that first day without hitting a bird, which is I guess a major thing. Could you believe all those birds there? That's almost an unbelievable thing. Once the motor cools, it take, doesn't take long to cool off. Then I don't want to fly. It. Come on, puppy. I know it's cold. I know you want to move to Houston. Be with the big fish. The time that we put the spats on and the nose weight, uh, we're going to try more and less tip weight. A variety of props I hope and hopefully somewhere in here we're gonna to have to make a handle because the handle on this is way off but this will just give you some indication of where this would be early on in the trim and I think the tank trim is still off
you on that flight, it had two, the whole two ounces of nose weight in, I'm going to take a little bit out. Okay, and the next flight will be 14.5 rev up, a little bit of nose weight out, lead out's back just a little bit. We really do need that Ray Brother. Ray B.